Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled I saved you, brother, last night. I didn't tell you, didn't read the next verse down. I read to you where he said, come apart and rest a while. Oh, great. But the next verse down, it tells us there's 5,000 people come out there and found them. <laughs> with with 10,000 problems. <laughs> they was hungry and they were sick and everything else. The preacher that has the power of God working in his life can't really get hid very long. The people's going to find him. Now, we're living in a time it's, it's walk our legs off hunting them, but if we're in the move of God, they'll hunt us out. I had a lawyer walk in my office a few weeks ago, and he said, I just come over here to ask you to tell me how to get the Holy Ghost. Oh, I said, well, I'd be very happy. <laughs> I said, now, isn't that something? Uh, folks get so hungry, they have to look us up. Just knocking on the door, you know. Just needing help. Praise the Lord. But if you'll notice, out in the hills where there used to be a spring of water, trails the animals of the forest looking for water. But if it goes dry, the trail will grow up. They'll look for another water hole. Right? When the preacher is an artesian well, overflowing, they're going to come. Amen. When I get ready to uh, have a, maybe call somewhere to have a healing service, a camp meetings or something, I prepare for it. I pray, I read the scriptures. <laughs> And I say them, and like I said, you know, you you got to say it. Everything the Lord ever created, He did it with words. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And let there be, and let there be. And rise, take up your bed, and walk. He had to say it. And uh, there's something about when the Word of God is deep inside, as I was telling you last night, and then you say it. You quote the very living Word of God, and it's God speaking. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And you give it power by having prayer and faith behind it. But over and over, I have watched when I get in tune in the dimension where the healing is working. There is a place where it works. You know that. You preachers know that. There's a place where you get where souls will be touched, you know. You can't create conviction. Not a living thing in the world you can do to create conviction, only preach the Word. Amen. We can scare them, but they won't stay. But real, burning, Holy Ghost conviction will get a hold of him. Like a brother said last night, a woman's mind was open to the oneness of the Godhead. You can't beat it in the head. It comes as a revelation. But as I pray and I'm getting in tune, suddenly my phone begins to ring across the nation. I, I need help. I'm sick. I'm having a breakdown. Dying with cancer. Preachers, heart attacks, different things. You know why they're calling me? The Spirit moved them to because I was in tune. The Lord never sends people to a dry water hole. When you've got it, God will use it. If you don't have it, he'll pick the fellow out. It does have it. That's why we as ministers have to stay in tune with the Holy Ghost. And whenever you're in tune for lost souls, they'll walk in your office like that lawyer did. Them. And you got the Holy Ghost. And baptized in Jesus' name. They're not as hard to convince some of these doctors and lawyers as I've preached to. I baptize them in Jesus' name. I talked to a doctor one night, 30 minutes, on baptism in Jesus' name. He said, sounds like the truth to me. He said, when could you do it? I said, to right now. So, 
But I had something here. I wrote this down. I want to pass this on to you ministers. The secret of the genius, like Einstein and Edison and all these fellas, the secret. And I thought, now, that's a good one. They know how to work without waste of energy. We waste a lot of it sometimes by worrying instead of praying. And I'll tell you what, when you preach your heart out, that's not all. A preacher will rule his church more and better on his knees sometime after the service is over when they're trying to sleep than he will in the pulpit. But they know how to work without waste of uh, energy in order to get the best that's within themselves. Now, this is it. They learn to eliminate from their thoughts and actions everything which would subtract from their purpose. They learn to eliminate, subtract. You know, we always add. I was telling Brother uh, Kraft about a call I made several years ago when he's all tense stuff. I said, you remember? And he said, yeah. I said, if you came up on a, a truck, if you was driving a truck and they loaded with brick and you began to smell rubber and finally the thing just stalled it on you, tires burning up, I said, you got out and you saw your overload springs flat down on the tire. I said, what would you do? Pile some more brick on or unload now, most of us preachers, we pile on a few more, you know. <laughs> when the smoke, you can smell the smoke for a mile. We're still piling on brick. We've got to learn to subtract, to eliminate some things, lest we be crushed. Praise God. When I woke up early this morning, 6 o'clock, you see, you fellas slept. Uh, I hear there's some mean preachers here <laughs> where they slept last night. There's always two or three who won't let you sleep. Did you ever notice that? <laughs> <laughs> you had a good time, though, didn't you? You could at least laugh. And uh, But there's always some around. I remember one time we used to go fishing in the wagon days. And I get to think, I was coming by over here back through the country and I saw a John Deere uh, place, you know, where they made all these different things. When I was a boy, to own a John Deere wagon was like owning a Cadillac now, you know. That is an outstanding wagon, you know. But anyway, we'd go fishing and we'd sleep on pilots. So one night... There's about eight or ten families. We all got in the wagon and went down to the lake. And, and uh, you know, you tie the horses up, you know, the trees and here and there. So uh, <clears throat> way over in the morning, one of the boys decided to have some fun. So there's all out in the woods there on pilots, you know, fathers and mothers and kids. And, and he got him some harness wrapped it around and started running down through there hollering wool. <laughs> well, brother, he had to leave. Of course, people were grabbing young ones. <laughs> so I imagine that's about what some of you fellas pull in last night. But if a preacher don't laugh, he'll cry. So it's better to laugh than to cry. There's a time to cry. <laughs> but I I woke up this morning and this is on my mind I just uh, I wrote down a whole bunch of stuff here just jotted it down and I'll just uh, what I was thinking about and my uh, text for the next few minutes will be keeping your footing in times like these keeping your footing oh and you know the story here you read it and you preached it a hundred times True to the Lord, this is Psalm 73, truly God is good 
to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. One thing about old David, he, he just plain confessed it. Amen. And uh, here was his problem. I was envious uh, at the charismatic. No, uh, envious at the foolish. When I saw the prosperity of the charismatic, I mean the wicked. There was no bands in their death, and their strength is firm. I think he's exaggerating a little here now, watching uh, they, he admitted it later. They are not in trouble as other men. Well, they jail housing and everywhere else, and we hadn't been yet. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. You know what he went on to say in here, where he said, uh, Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. I have preached standards and look like they're growing faster. I am. You know, and Jesus getting his church ready. He's getting it on the firm foundation. And they said, this is a hard saying. He said, in essence, if you can't take it, there's a road. I'm going to have a church for this few or many founded right on the right doctrine everything I will have one that's Jesus if I can't have the kind of church that was planned from the foundation of the world he said I just plain won't have one and if I can't have an apostolic church and preach it like it is I just move out under a tree and let the world go by But anyway, he said, for all the day long have I been plagued and chastened and every morning. Somebody on our trail, and of course, you know, preachers, they have problems with patience, you know. The Lord told Abraham, said, Abraham, I make your father many. <coughs> Ten years went by, and I don't know, young. Fifteen years, young. And he'd meet old John. He had sixteen kids. He wasn't worth the salt that went in his bread. <laughs> All of them boys. Sarah said to Abraham, I don't understand it. Old Sister Lou down there has got 18 young'uns. And she's a long-tongued old hussy. She, I don't understand. 18 young'uns? He said, yeah, I'll just look at an old bell with 15. And uh, so they got impatient. And they messed up. And the world's been messed up ever since. God to help us preachers to keep our feet Solid. Yes, sir. Amen. God said it. He'll do it. That's right. He'll do it. I don't always agree with the Lord. He's too slow for me sometimes. But I have been able to hurry him up. He just don't seem to... You know, in the Bible he said he didn't pay no attention to him. They hollered and yelled. They hollered and yelled. That's one of the marvelous things about the Lord. He doesn't pay attention to him. Amen. Now, Lord, well, now you know, you know who I am. Yep. Sure do. I know you need something too. And it ain't what you're asking for right now. You need a little patience, you know. The lady came up to old brother B. E. Eccles. Said, Brother Eccles, pray for me. To have patience. He laid his hands on her head and said, Oh, God, send this woman trials and tribulations. She jumped up and she said, 
My God, Brother Eckle said, that's what... Said, I, said, I beat up with that now? I said, that ain't what I want. He said, well, the Bible said that's the way you get them. Yeah. Yeah. And us preachers ought to have a lot of them. We are tried sometimes. And I don't know, I was thinking... Somebody the other day was talking about he, he gave up his office in Louisiana. He said, I've just got to stay home my wife and my church. And I said, yeah. I said, maybe that's why the Pope decided preachers didn't need wives. They figured they never would be with them no way. <laughs> but it's a good thing Elijah didn't have a wife. Jezebel is paying too much special attention to him. But I hear from one every now and then, if there's a Jezebel on his trail, she'd give him her husband's phone number and address. But that don't happen too often. I tell you, the, the best friend we got is Jesus. Hallelujah. The next best friend is our wife. Right. Yes, sir. That's good. That's good. Praise the Lord. And I tell him at the breakfast table today, I said, the reason a lot of preachers get in trouble. I said, if you'll watch splits and different things that's happening, there's always a key fella somewhere motivating. motivating. Yes, right. uh -huh. He don't get right out in the limelight, but he's dropping this and dropping that. Yeah. Until we learn to join hands with one another and love one another and, rel and, and realize the fact we're to follow nobody but Jesus. Glory. That's right. Yes, sir. That's the fellas walking my office a few years ago. They were followers, the head men of William Branham's movement. And they knew that in years had gone by that we had been together and prayed together. And, and it was on tapes and different things, you know. And they came over to feel me out. And I said, now, look, I believe what he preached when he preached the truth. But they said, now, look, you've got to believe he is God's prophet to be saved. I said, you're off your rocker. Yeah. Amen. I said, I'm only to believe Jesus Christ and him crucified to be saved. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. That's right. And I said, have you ever read in the Bible that prophets made mistakes in the Bible? Somebody introduced me one time as a prophet. Well, I'll tell you, the prophet just lives in my house like he does yours. Right. I said, that's very dangerous. I said, I find in the Bible where God, if they prophesied exactly the way he said prophesy, well, the people killed him. <laughs> and if he didn't prophesy the way God told him to prophesy, God killed him. <laughs> Between a rock and a hard place. But I'd rather God had kill me than the devil's crowd. Praise God. But I said, you see, here is where you fellas are off. I said, now, we know the prophets, the mistakes they made in the Bible because the Lord tells us it's written that the prophet of God lost his gifts and direction and got killed. And even Jeremiah, the great prophet, was carried away with another prophet. It was a false prophet, and the Lord had to straighten him out on it. Men are human. And I said, you can't put all your faith in any human being. I said, now, you tell me that William Branham was perfect in every way. And I said, really, I don't... Uh, I don't know about that. I said, I uh, <clears throat> I know that all of us have got faults and failures, but you are telling me that there's not one all against him. I said, I can't read about him in here. All right. uh -huh. yes, sir. The Lord hadn't wrote down for us to read what he th thought about the man right. all the way through. Right. Well, they said, tell you one thing, said that type minister's over. 
And all of a sudden, when they said I had a strange feeling, I didn't know, the, know these fellas. I looked at one of them sitting there and I said, you've been married before. You're not living with the woman you started out with. He said, that's right. I turned to another and I said, you were worried about what that homosexual made a pass at you the other day. Why did he make a pass at me? He said, you're right. They walked out. I hadn't seen them anymore. God can work through anybody he wants to work through. Amen. Amen. Just don't worry about it. We'll give ourselves to him. He'll take care of us. And he loves us. Don't ever forget that. He loves us. He loves us. I was telling you a little about the battle and along about the same time whenever the Lord appeared to me. I was having a missionary service in Menden and this same thing happened and it just literally made me sick. You know how it is. Your kids are so close to you. And, uh, of course, I dedicated her to the Lord, and I'm going to see her in heaven in spite of the devil and all of his angels. And uh, I was lying there on the couch, and I was going ahead of the service. The preacher was preaching, and I said, Lord, uh, you know, we, we get a little down sometime, you know. I said, I know you do, but if you love me, I said, would you have somebody just come in here and tell me that he already had it planned three days before one of the missionaries while he's in Bogalusa the Lord spoke to him and said when you get to Menden go tell T.W. Barnes I love him Mama. and he was sitting in and all of a sudden it hit him and he got up and left while the preacher was preaching in five minutes after I said that and knelt by my bed, couch in there, and he said, Brother Barnes, before I left Bogalusa, I don't understand it, I don't know why, but the Lord told me just to tell you that he loves you. He loves us preachers. He really does. When we're down and going through the valley, he loves us. He knows what we're going through. And sometimes there's a reason for it that we can't see. But Job said, though he slay me, I'll trust him. I'm going to hang in there. I'd like to reminisce just a little bit, keeping our footing in times like these. I, I've been in this, this month 60 years. I've been preaching 47 Sixty years ago, in the month of March, I came in contact with Pentecost, Jesus' name, Holy Ghost. And they laid it down then, straight and hard. A lot of water's gone under the bridge. I was in the, in the church a long time before we got organized. We had a mess. We'd have revival, somebody else come along and tear it up. We had preachers come through that had two or three wives. We didn't know it. There's no way to check up on nobody. Just, uh, yeah, just, everybody was all tore up. And I never was so glad when the brethren got together and decided we're going to be apostolic. We're going to put our name on the dotted line. And, uh, our name's going to be known where people can check up on us. They want to. You know why a lot of people don't like organization? They don't want to be checked upon. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. Right. You know why some don't want it? They want to eat their members out, but they don't want nobody to set them straight. Right. Right. All right. That's good. And some of them in my time has left it in order to get the church and run all the good saints off and sell it and put the $100,000 in their pocket. Well, there's a lot of reasons, you know. Now, I'm not saying organization alone saves anybody. No, 10,000 times, no. But we're all pulling together. That's why we're here. We're pulling together. We believe the same thing. And I have watched them come and I've watched them go. 
in those days, far off days, and I watched them split. I watched the splinter groups pulling off. Unhappy. I don't know all the reason. Some of them would get great revelation. One fellow, he had fasted 40 days, so he said. I doubt it. Some of these fellows fast, and they drink grape juice and orange juice and, and milkshakes, and they just don't eat bread and onions. I, I know some people's done that, but some of these fellows uh, just didn't pan out. I think if he had fasted and prayed 40 days, he wouldn't have let them devils got him. Like yeah. Yeah. Anyway, he came up with a great revelation, you know, that we were so many years behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had his little uh, rubber stamps. i never forget at one of our camp meetings, not in Louisiana, and it wasn't in Mississippi, but uh, they split off. This fellow had a revelation that the name, baptism was obsolete and all these things. He was just, he was a, uh, what you call a fanatical, uh, charismatic before his time. He was plain fanatic. And he had money. That's the thing about it. He was worth about a half a million dollars. The preacher's borrowing money from him. He took advantage of him. And all of a sudden, after that day, I was there whenever this, the, uh, the assistant, we call him chairman then, pulled off and went with him. He, they had some type healing ministry, they claimed. Church didn't believe in it. We've always believed in healing. That's right. Fellow ain't got good spiritual sense if you don't. Anyway, he got another revelation that he was to leave his wife and eight children and marry a 19 year old girl. Because they was going to have a son that would set the world on fire. But it happened to be a girl. <laughs> That's some of the things way back yonder. Way back yonder. Wild, fanatical stuff. It's a strange thing how the devil will work. He works on us so many different ways. He'll come at you, you know. And uh, try to make you think you're somebody come. Somebody that if she is to die, the church would just fold up overnight. We needn't be one no more. And I have noticed that men that love camp meetings and conferences usually keep their footing a lot better than those that don't. Because we need one another. We must have one another. Praise God. And now, just discuss this just a little. The devil, I watched him work on preachers. And it's so easy if we get, if we get to a place Maybe we're 40, somewhere in there. We've got a good church, finances, everything going. That's a dangerous time, preacher. If we ever stop praying, we're in trouble. The preacher that prays stays out of trouble. That woman in my office last week had run off with one of our preachers a year or two ago. And she said, I wish I'd have never seen him. Well, she evidently thought he was going to keep his high place, you know. And he went to the gutter. As That's what happens, you know. Yeah. I hear these things, you know. And I some of the saddest experiences I've had is to stand by the bedside of a minister dying, lost. I'm thinking of one outstanding minister, but he fell into sin and he stayed in it, stayed in it till he just, God cut him off. 
And I, I would try to pray with him. He was dying. He'd say, Brother Barnes, don't waste your breath. I'm doomed to a lake of fire. He said, I prayed, but it don't do any good. I said, God, don't hear my prayer. And it was just like praying for that poor pit. He lay hands on him. There was no flow. Nothing. He drew his last breath and went into eternity saying, I'm lost forever. Mm. If ever we need to get close to our wives and stay there, don't, Amen. don't ever take them just for granted. Let's love. It's absolutely necessary, preachers, for us to love the feminine spirit of a woman and not just a body. Now, you can pass that on to other folks. But a woman, unless she loves the masculine spirit in a man, she'll never be a good wife. That's part, that's the man. The masculine spirit that God placed there made in his image and unless she loves that part of him she'll give him nothing but trouble unless she'll love that feminine spirit inside of her body and have fellowship with it you see there's three steps to being totally completely happy here you have a as I mentioned last night you've got a body you've got a soul you've got a spirit and the human soul of every man and woman desires fellowship with their companion. That's the soul's cry, to talk to one another, to laugh together, cry together, whatever. The soul yearns for that. I don't care how big you are and how strong you are. If you're married, your soul desires fellowship with that feminine spirit. And then the human spirit desires someone he can trust. Someone will trust it. You take trust out of a marriage, it won't be long till fellowship goes. And it's a body marriage, and they fall apart. But when it's body, soul, and spirit, the way God Almighty planned it, it'll never fall apart. There won't be any looking over the fence. Because you have found everything in a woman your soul desires. Trust and love for that part, the feminine part. She needs to be listened to. And you need to listen to her. It's good for you to stop and to listen. She can be a great help at all times. My wife has been so strong. Over the years, she don't talk much. She's strong. She's approaching the time of the change of life. I said, wife, I counsel ladies that's going through this all the time. I said, I want you to prepare yourself before you get there through prayer, faith, reading some good medical books. And whenever she came to that, she went through it with flying colors. You know, there's a lot of times if you don't have your mind made up and your faith applied before the thing hits you, you get flusterated. But if you know where you're going, you got your plans. It's already nailed down. Then it's a lot easier. Amen. Glory. 
Praise the Lord. Now, one of the great needs that I've watched in days gone by is watching preachers fall by the wayside and leave the organization get in trouble, you know. All these things. Uh, they need a balance. Yes, sir. There is a need for balance in the preacher's life. Balance by the Word of God. You watch these fellows, they'll go to the extremes this way one time, right. and the next way, time the other way, you know. And they've sat in my office lately and they say, well, we don't see anything wrong in cutting hair, women cutting hair. I said, you know where you're headed? I said, you know, you say, well, don't be contentious about it. Just let them do what they want to I said, the next thing you'll be doing is saying, don't be contentious about water baptism. Let them baptize the way they want to. Yeah. <laughs> don't be contentious about the Holy Ghost being the new birth. Just, you know, get saved or whatever you know. That's why they hated and don't know it. That's right. They threw up their hands if you told them they'd be preaching that. But they are. You know some of them. When they left, you know. And I had some similar God girls in my office. One of them's in the church now, been baptized in Jesus' name. And they, but they was telling me, they said, we don't understand, you know. Of course, they came in and grew up in the assemblies of God. Uh, they didn't know about them days whenever they were just as strict on as we are. I said, I can remember well when your church preached it just like we preached it. And I put this question to them. I said, well, why is it? That for 19, over 1900 years, it was right for the ladies of the church to have long hair. Then in this end time, all of a sudden, it's all right. In 1920, they started it in the United States. I remember it well. And the Baptist preachers was preaching against it then. But that's something to think about. For 1,900 years, don't be contentious. Paul said there's not but one way. We don't have any other method. That's right. Right. That's right. And for 1,900 years, it went that way. Then somebody gets a great revelation. Uh -huh. But it didn't come from the book. No, sir. No, sir. But Paul didn't write a whole chapter there on it and then say, well, it don't make any difference. And then write all about the Holy Ghost from Genesis to Revelation that coming in the future, then finally wind up saying, well, you don't have to have it no way. <laughs> you know, they get the idea that if I made a mistake one time, I got off from false doctrine one time. One time. One of our elders put out a tract that ties was not in the New Testament, it said it would drive a lot of people away getting up preaching ties. And our church is another word left impression. Just fill up if you just wouldn't be beating them over the head about ties. I was pastoring my first church. Well, I thought, well, he's one of the old timers. Maybe he's right. Maybe it is under the law. And I got up, and Brother E.F. Cannon. Superintendent Arkansas was one of my members, and he went along with it, too. Pretty good, because he was a tie fan. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what happened? He didn't add anybody to the church. In fact, some quit. They got so happy-go-lucky over everything, they just quit. I guess they used the ties to go to the picture show. And you know what happened to the old pastor? He like starved to death. Rats eat my only suit of clothes I had up. My shoes wore out. I'd had no money. I decided it was good for them and me <laughs> <laughs> to pay tithes. Yes, sir. But you see, I could just see them just. And a lot of them, you say, well, we're going to lower our standard now and tell them they can cut the hair, and here they come. One did it over close to me, and a hundred of his good ones left. Falling apart. Look, 
The world is waiting for an apostolic challenge. When you get the real thing, they'll die for it. They'll go to jail for it. They were burned to a stake. They wondered about the sheep clothing. When you get the real thing, a little old junky stuff that they're talking about that's keeping them out, don't keep anybody out. Acts 2.38 didn't keep those Jews out. 3,000 come in. When you preach it with the Holy Ghost. Now, if you think you're going to lower your standard, I don't believe nobody here like that. And they, they're just going to flock in. Hey? Because you know better. Now, they can't over there because uh, they hadn't got it yet. Right. That's not the apostolic church. Right. Right. The apostolic church preaches repentance, yeah. water baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And not only that, but it's an essential to salvation. Right. And holiness. Right. And that's it. Yes, and the Lord will never send anybody out there. They just find it and go. When the Lord told Cornelius he needed somebody to tell him how to be saved, he didn't hunt up one of these liberals. All right. He got the man with the keys, said, send for Peter, he'll tell you how to do it. Glory to God. And when the Lord sends an angel to somebody, he's not going to send them, tell them to go somewhere where they don't baptize in Jesus' name. He's going to send them to the truth. Now, there's a lot of folks floating out there. They're just floating around. But there's a real, genuine church that's setting in the earth, true blue, 100%. I don't know what you see, preacher, when you look at tomorrow. I've often thought about the pilgrims. And when they landed in 1620, after 65, long, weary, dangerous days, and when they looked, there was a wilderness. There was wild Indians. There was lions. There was tigers. But they left a country where they couldn't worship God like they wanted to. They didn't look at the Indians. They didn't look at all of that. They looked at one thing where we can worship God the way we want to worship God. But you know, when they landed there, there wasn't much to look at. Only by faith. Yes. You know, there were some of those leaders saw beyond the Indian, the lions and the tigers. They saw farms, colonies, little churches, little damn roads here and there. But only the prophet could have stood and say. That is going to be the greatest nation on the face of the earth. One day there'll be super highways from one end of it to the other. There'll be jet airplanes screaming through the sky, automobiles, skyscrapers, richest nation on the face of the earth sending missionaries more than all the other nations put together around the world. But one day there was nothing but danger and trouble, and endings, and malarial fever, and mosquitoes, and all of that. But the old pioneer spirit said, we can. Hallelujah. We can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. What do you see, preacher? What do you see? Well, I see pornography. I see the abortionist crowd. I see... Uh, I see the television, and it looks like it's hopeless, mm. they'll say. God didn't raise apostolic preachers up to look at that, no, sir. Hallelujah. but to look beyond it to the greatest revivals the world has ever seen. Hallelujah. If an old journal's got a certain area that he needs uh, help, and the best 
He sends his best trained men to that ear. And he puts the best weapons he's got in their hands and said, go. When the Lord was planning this church from the foundation of the world, he had his book out writing it all down. There's going to be a Pentecost after the cross. There's going to be an outpouring. He's going to have some problems. Even the Jews are not going to spread it to the Gentiles like they should. They're going to be still be a little bit bound to their... I don't know. We're going to have some dark ages. And I'm going to bring them out of it. And I'm going to raise up the best preachers the world's ever had for the end time. I'm going to select the best. I'm going to give them my best. Everything I've got. Because they're facing the days of the Antichrist. And that's you and that's me. If I didn't believe it, I'd walk out now. He knew from the foundation of the world that you would be sitting here today. God foreknew all things. He raised you up from your mother's womb and called you to preach the gospel in 1985. He has his very best to give to you. He will not hold withhold anything from you. Everything he's got, he said, let's go. Let's go. But now we can get a little over-fearful about the Antichrist. And we are the people that can hinder him until he's cross-eyed. That's right. I want you to know we are hated in the pits of hell because we have held him back 2,000 years. Yes, sir. Paul said he was back in his day. A lot of folks acted like they ain't going to be no Antichrist till right after the rapture and, and he said, come on and it's right here it's going to happen maybe this year or next let me tell you something we've got a lot of work to do there's a world lost out there and I don't believe God has bared his arm like he wants to and give it a swing oh thank God hallelujah amen, <laughs> amen. now I look to the Lord sure but if you're not careful, you get the idea, just sort of give up, can't do it, no how. Because the Lord's coming this year or next. He may not come for 20 years. Right. Then he may come today. When I was a young fella in the early days, the good old days, they were preaching the Lord was coming in either 28 or 29. Track spout on him. I wish I'd have kept some of them. You're the living daylights out of us. I don't think anybody put a good post in the ground. <laughs> there was no need to paint the church because it is all over. <laughs> Brother, I heard them say, man, look at them automobiles. Look at them airplanes. That's some little old bitty ones flying around. <laughs> and this is it. This year or next. Well, 28 went by. He didn't come. 29 was moving in. We set up till midnight at last night. Any minute, I said, my God, I hope I'm ready. <laughs> five minutes, he's going to come within this next five minutes. Daddy say, you kids, pray. <laughs> Brother, we is praying and shouting and talking in tongues and... I'll tell you, something did come. A depression. <laughs> we ought to have been planting potatoes. <laughs> I told some of them I'd already been through the tribulation. One of them. You couldn't buy in a cell. You didn't have no money to buy with. You didn't have nothing to sell. And they come out with the three sixes, chill, honey. <laughs> I drank the mark of the beast. At least that kind. 
And that was the bitter stuff I ever put in my mouth. And I believe he's coming, and I believe the mark of the beast is coming. The real. But I said this. If we're not careful, Satan will use this to get us to relax and not do nothing. And he said, occupy until I come. Stay with it. Hammer away. Amen. If I'm coming tomorrow, I want you to do a good job today. Well, I've, these fellows are coming through every few years. They're either telling us the Lord's coming the next year or two, or they coming through saying the day's revival's over. And some of them got the nerve to say it now. When it's just blowing up all around them. Revival everywhere. But they say it's not the right kind. Yeah. You see, I don't know, the 120 might have had a little of that in them. Somebody come running back and said, Hey, you, you fellas not the only one got it? It's the 3,000 got it out in the street. No, uh uh-uh. uh. Well, you got to get it in the upper room. <laughs> Did get a good experience, you know. Some of them, if you three gets it, everybody in some districts. Glory! But if you said 50, good near sound. They don't believe in big things. They believe in little bitty, teensy wincy toothpick days. God shriveled up. He's become Church of Christ. And they come and they go. I was standing in the brother's chambers. We were looking at a crowd, the general conference, about 15, 20,000. I thought to him, I said, uh, what if some young fellow that got up and prophesied this 30 years ago? He looked at me and he said, they'd have called him a fanatic. I said, there'll never be no such that we're supposed to go the other way. Yeah. And that's the truth. Be it unto you according to your faith. Now, there's one other thing that hinders some ministers. They get lost in the crowd. Well, I'm just a little nobody. Now, you said that. And the devil said, Amen. But the Lord didn't say that. I know where you're at, he said. Now, he... He's got to have a man to do this job, and he's got to have one to do that. He's got to have one to go to a big city, and he's got to have one to go to a little city. He's got to have one that'll go out in the country. And he's got to have one that'll go out in the highways and the hedges. Now, the fellow he sent to the big city that had the big church, he could turn around the other way and send him to the highways and hedges and set the fellow he sent out there that never did have but 13 in Sunday school and that had both been a success right. if they listen to God. Listen to God. You see, it's a call. God has to have men here, has to have men there. That's right. Why can't we be happy? But if you were, there's not but a hundred people and you've got 99 of them, don't be content till you get that other one. See, hang in there. That's what the Lord wants you to do. And when you have gathered in the hundred and you got them when the Lord comes, your reward will be as great as a fellow that had a hundred thousand. That's right. Amen. Absolutely. Glory. When can we learn that? I am a minister called and ordained, and there's no big eyes, there's no little use. With God, we're all His, working where He wants us to work. But a lot of fellows are backslid because I know one fellow. I was over to uh, was over in Dallas, and he said, "I want you to go with me out here to see A.E. Allen's tent." I said, "All right, all right. Well, he's a friend of mine. Preached revivals for me." And he said, "Now, boy," he said, "That's it. That's it." He said, "When are you gonna give up your church and do that?" Well, I said. I never forget what I said. I looked at him. I said, Richard, 
When I can feel his content, preach into fifty. That's ten thousand. And stay the same. I might go. But he went. And he backslid. And he got a vision. And he's somewhere in Arkansas, sitting on a mountain, waiting for Louisiana to go under the water. Been there 20 years. You know, some of you know who I'm talking about. I love him. But you see, I just said, now, Lord, you saying Louisiana's going under the water? Yes. I said, you tell me the day and the hour so I can work here and just leave 30 minutes before it goes under. I need to get these folks saved. Yeah. But he's been up there 20 years and it hadn't come yet. You see, these wild, troublesome spirits can blow you up until you're just like a balloon and the devil's right ready to puncture you. Now, some of these fellows out there that's having the big go, left the truth, do anything you want to do, big enough to do, you know why they still have crowds? Some of them. The devil called off all of his demons, said, I don't want any of you to go over there. That he's doing just what I want him to do. And I want him to look good. And the whole bunch will backslide and he'll be in sin with a woman or drunk or something for long. And it'll all blow up one time. But I don't want you fellas to bother him now. I don't want even a sick fly to go over there. <laughs> go away and jump on them UPCs. I heard one fellow up here, Brother Kraft, he's changed the song. He brought me out of the deep Mari clay. He sings it to his church. He brought me out of the UPC. <laughs> what a deliverance. What a deliverance. <laughs> Balanced preachers. Now today, I talked about yesterday, some of the things back there I could go on and on on that. God help us. But today, this is our day. This is a day that God's raising up even young men. I've watched some fellas in their 20s doing marvelous things. It amazes me. It just thrills me. Praise God. And do you know what? If we all preach the same the truth, the devil has a tougher time. Now, I remember a time that there wasn't too many preaching gifts of the Spirit, Brother Craft. Right. And the devil jumped on me for all four feet. But if every preacher had been preaching it like it should have been preached, you know, if there'd have been 10,000 Job's, the devil would have, he wouldn't have run around him. It's too many. And the more of us preaching the same thing, right. sticking yeah. together, yeah. Yeah. that's the thing puts it over. Yeah. You don't take anything from me or somebody else is being used. It just gives us a bigger feel, a greater feel out there. You let one man, when he is coming up with the truth, the devil was after him with everything he had. But thank God we're growing by leaps and bounds. God's, I was just telling Brother Kraft, God's given us good spiritual leaders in so many places. Men with a vision, looking for great things. Now, let's talk about tomorrow just a little. Then, if you want to ask a question or something, I don't know. I may have wandered around a little here, but we just preachers talking, thinking. While I've been talking, you've been reminiscing too. You've been seeing some things back yonder. So you could all do a better job at it than me. But when I look at tomorrow... And that, I'm not talking about way off somewhere in another day. Today and tomorrow. When I look at it, I see victory. I see God doing something to people. And our brother talking about the lady last night, God just did something to her mind. 
open it to the truth. Yes, sir. See? You could have argued to that woman, talked to her, and I don't know, they just take, when you say one, they say three. Yeah. Th th that's tradition. The tradition of the elders. It's just beat in them and beat in them and beat in them. It takes a visitation of the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. Glory to God. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. And you see, the one thing we need to do, now we have a revelation of the name, we have a revelation of the one God, and I love it. But now we've got to get it to them in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost that will remove the veil. Right. 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 Yes. Exactly. Well, they can see it. You may have heard me tell it, but I was, I've been preaching to people, you know, just go in and, and, uh, talk to them about faith, you know, this one old fellow, he was dying and he called me and heard me, he's a Methodist preacher, I heard me on the radio and the moment he come. And while I was just preaching faith to him, he jumped out of the bed, said, I'm healed and I want the Holy Ghost. I fought tongues 40 years, he said, and now I see it. I hadn't said a thing about tongues, hadn't no, said no. a thing about the Holy Ghost, but I see it, I see it, I see it. You see, suddenly the veil was lifted. There it is. That's our job, to minister until it happens. So often we we dealing with the intellect of man <laughs> instead of the heart. When our sermons and this word is soaked in prayer and it You know why Jesus went to Calvary? Two reasons. First, he was persuaded that his dying would shed blood that was powerful enough to forgive the worst person. You ready? And then he was persuaded that death wasn't powerful enough to hold him. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'm going to raise it back up. You know why we got a church? And I'm persuaded I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If God is persuaded, why don't you get persuaded? Let's say it again, ready? The three, the three greatest words in life. Thank you. It's not God is love. It's I am persuaded God loves me. It's not God is able to heal. It's I am persuaded God will heal me. Uh, we've had such moves of the Holy Ghost here. And yet somehow God has said to my heart, tell these people the greatest thing they'll get out of this whole conference is to walk out of here with an innate persuasion. So, uh, I got a word for you. Some of you got prayed for. Some of you got anointed. Some of you got spit all over. Somebody slapped you around and you didn't get your healing. The Lord told me to tell you, tell my people, sometimes my healing comes as a seed. And they want a full harvest. That's a miracle. But miracles are not always given to people. But healing comes as a seed. What does that mean? You better be persuaded the seed can be stolen. You better water it. You better protect it. You better nurture it. You better pray over it. You better bless it. You better encourage it. You better talk to it. You better be persuaded that the miracle is in the seed.